We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Anais. I'm Andy. And I'm Gerald. And I'm also super excited to discuss <coughs> this week's story because, as I was saying in Slack before I was rudely shut down by Andy, um, <laughs> I read this story and I was like, oh, obviously the Red Tower must represent this. It's so obvious. And then I started doing some research and no one says that. I even Googled. Th Thomas Ligotti, The Red Tower, and what I think it's a metaphor for, for, which I won't spoil just yet, and nothing came up for it. I'm like, what? Uh -oh. Am I going crazy? So then I started doubting my interpretation of this because to me it was so obvious, but no one else talks about it that I could find. I didn't, I didn't search that hard, but come on. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, it should have come up. You would Beautiful. think so. And then oh. Andy in Slack was like, oh, I do this podcast with some friends where we discuss short stories. You should totally come on and discuss that. <laughs> it just I didn't want you wasting your material. <laughs> <laughs> my material of self-doubt. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what keeps the wheels turning. Yeah. All right. <sighs> Gerald, do you have any um, strong interpretations that you want to dive into or not so much? No. I'm too busy watching the cricket. Um. <laughs> oh, yes. Gerald is missing oh. England in the World Cup final for this. He's missing yeah. England lose. Mm -hmm. Cricket, my word. It's a game that you Americans wouldn't understand. It's, it's, it's very technical. It's like we baseball, have... but much less interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Who's the other team in the World Cup? New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand. Mm. That's, yeah, I, that's a country Andy. that's like underneath at the other side of the planet. I did know? research so that I could tease Gerald about it more accurately. Okay. Yeah. You said New Zealand, like, oh, I always knew that. <laughs> Listen, an hour ago, you were talking about how who even plays cricket and you were going to joke <laughs> Jamaica. And then it turned out Jamaica actually does play cricket. Yeah. They got a whole West sense. Indies team, including the U.S. They Virgin have. Islands. So and pretty much all the like former colonies. The United <laughs> States also plays cricket. Does it? Yeah. U.S. Virgin Islands. That's a U.S. territory. They're on the West oh, Indies come team. On. All I'm saying come is on. we beat England in 1979. Anyway. I like 92 points. Or points. <laughs> However, 92 <scored>. points. 92 <laughs> of them. <laughs> I don't know what kind of scoring mechanics you guys no. have. <laughs> I feel like we need to get back on firmer ground, which is literary analysis. We're a little better yeah. at that. Anise, yeah. what's the story okay. about? <laughs> yeah, what is the story about? I can tell you, but no one would agree yeah, with Yeah, do tell us. Okay, so this week we read The Red Tower by Thomas Ligotti. It's um, a horror, a literary horror. A lot of people consider Thomas Ligotti the heir to Lovecraft. Anyway, but not the racism. But not the racism. <laughs> Yay. That's good. Uh, that's great. So The Red Tower, it's one of his uh, more well-known short stories. It's about... A factory that's three stories high. It has red bricks, no doors, no loading docks, no windows, even on the first floor, just on the second and third floor. And it's in a desolate gray landscape, nothing around. So it's like the only blip on the horizon. And the narrator of the story um, has never been there, but he knows everything about it based on, you know, witnesses of people who are like dying and delirious who like know about it. It's never clear if these people work there. My sense is no, because... Well, anyway. no, because nobody's ever seen it. Yeah, no one's ever yeah. seen it. Not just uh, him. No one's seen it. No one. But it's, everyone it's, knows it's, about it. It's the ultimate old, unreliable narrator story, <laughs> I think. It it's is. Like multiple. And, but the thing is, also, the narrator like knows he's a bit unreliable because he's like, the only reason I care about this is because I'm a depraved degenerate at all times. <laughs> he's just reminding you. He's like, I'm trash for wanting to know about this. But <laughs> then I found out that this three-story factory has a subterranean level and I couldn't let go of this because it's the best. So then there's the subterranean, um, okay, so the factory manufactures weird nightmarish stuff, like a locket that when you open it has a screaming abyss or like huge gourds, like vegetables, that when you pick them up, scream. And then the subterranean system on level one subterranean system delivers them anywhere to anyone but it doesn't seem like it's like a specific address. Like it'll be like, oh, it's like in your attic behind grandma's clothes. <laughs> right. It's in your kidney. Why not? Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he didn't that say explains, specific that explains kidney. Right, lot. just inside yeah. a living or freshly deceased person. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, 
And then the second subterranean level is a small graveyard that the only light is uh, glowing paint on the walls. And then there's gravestones, but there's no names or dates. And they're actually birthing graves where creepy hyper organisms, fleshy monsters come out of it. And then the third subterranean level is rumored, not confirmed, where even more creepy stuff happens, the most ambitious projects. Mm. And there's a sort of magical back and forth between the factory and the desolate gray area. And when the desolate gray area sort of like wins the landscape, uh, all of the equipment inside the top three floors of the factory disappear. They literally oh. evaporate. Yeah. In italics evaporates. Yeah. In italics oh. evaporates. And they leave behind like a ghostly silhouette. And then that disappears too. <laughs> oh. That you can only see in moonlight. That you can only see in moonlight for a little bit, and then not even wow. in that anymore. And um, also, the red tower wasn't red in the beginning, probably, but now it is. And it seems like as the landscape wins, then um, all of the activities become more ambitious, more dark, and go into deeper subterranean levels. Which is why I'm like, this is such an obvious metaphor for something, but we'll get there. Um, <laughs> that's my summary. Nothing happens to the narrator. He just right, knows. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, nothing happens. <laughs> so, <sighs> wow. How did how did you like the story, Gerald? Um, I I liked it a lot. I liked it a lot. I, I, I it was it was great description. A great um, yeah. You you could really I. Uh, it's it's a sort of st it's a sort of story that that I liked and I disliked as well. I I. And on the surface level, I liked it. I, I liked the the fact that the way it described this this red tower, and but it didn't seem to go anywhere, and that was the problem. It it it, it sort of it just there's this tower, and it's like this, and then there's another level, and then there's another level, and da 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 da, da. and there's one paragraph where it says grey or greyness like about 33 times or something, well, four times. But it, it, it got a little bit annoying. Um, and so uh, it was entertaining. I wouldn't recommend it as a story because it wasn't really a story. It didn't go anywhere. It's just a description of this place, mm. uh, which was, which was a you know, nicely described spooky horror place, but it needed i think it needed something something else mm -hmm. uh andy did the plotless story bother you as much uh so let me first just say i was super excited to read something by thomas Legati. i've never read anything by him before but one of my internet heroes chris straub famous for brood hollow and tweet me harder <laughs> super loves Legati and recommends him all the time as like a less problematic Lovecraft that's more thought provoking and with none of the racism. Um, so I was like, wow, that sounds great. I I'm really going to dig into this. And then it was hot garbage and it's just, <laughs> it read like bad creepy pasta. I thought of creepy pasta too. Yeah. But bad creepy pasta. Like I've read a lot of creepy pasta and there's some good creepy pasta, but this is just, like, okay, the the explore a creepy place genre is like a specific trope that comes up all the time where the plot is, hey, I'm a guy breaking into this place. Oh, let me describe all the creepy things I see. And then at the end, I run away. And I'm fine with that being the thing, the explore a creepy place as the plot element. But just it's been done a million times so much better. And the weird signposting of everything, like. Oh, look, and this is creepy. What kind of things do they distribute? <laughs> Nightmarish things. Like, just <laughs> you're just saying things are creepy. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't add anything. It doesn't do anything. It's not building a tone of suspense. As problematic as he was, Lovecraft could fill you with existential dread. Mm, and this yeah. is just like, hey, isn't this place weird? Like, yeah, I guess it's weird, man. What are we doing? Yeah. Though, so I found this subreddit that was about Weird Lit that did a discussion of this, and I sort of read through it, which is, again, when I was like, how is no one on my metaphor? There's so many people talking right now. Anyway, um, but the subreddit was emphasizing, like, the Legati fans came out and said that for them, this story wasn't Legati's, like, greatest from the point of view of 
actual like plot or anything, but just like language wise, this was one of their favorites language wise. That it's when he can bring in these words, sometimes repeat things, use a lot of adjectives, but you don't get lost and you never feel like it's overwrought. I don't know if I'd, I'd agree that yeah, it's never overwrought. It's quite overwrought. But, yeah. but I think in this genre, doing that is like, you know, it's like one of the genre, not rules isn't the right way to put it, but like one of the things you come to expect as a reader of this genre, because Lovecraft does that too, just like a really heavy on descriptions. Um, so people liked it for that. And then there was a few comments that were like, on my first read through, I didn't care for it. On my second read through, it's like, they, they didn't use these exact terms, but reading it in between the text, like they liked what it was making them do like that they were questioning the unreliability of the narrator they were questioning how like all these witnesses are like delirious and dying no one who's like heart and healthy uh seems <laughs> to have any opinions about this um so i liked that um and you know like the sort of obvious thing everyone talks about is the main character is the tower the tower itself does have an arc it becomes redder over time. Its activities go more underground. It has this battle with the gray landscape outside. Um, and it becomes more and more ambitious and more and more creepy. Like one of the creepy things it made early on was cameos. Those little like locket things that have like a, like a bust or a face on them. Really, really heavy. So you can't pick it up. Okay. I don't know about that yeah, as a nightmare. That's so creepy. <laughs> that's so creepy. Yeah. And then a hyperorganism. Right. But then it has a clear arc from that to the hyperorganisms that are being birthed from graves. So there's something interesting about that arc as well, especially as this guy who describes himself as increasingly degenerate and depraved um, becomes more and more curious in what's underneath the Red Tower, which again seems very obvious to me. <laughs> so I, I will mm. say there was one specific turn of phrase I loved, which is. Mm -hmm. These were not what you might call burying graves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I guess a little, so it seems a little bit like what we're discussing here is like the difference between a story that you read to follow a theme and a plot. And once it just like a feeling like vignette <laughs> style, Gerald, having discussed short stories with you for years, you don't tend to love let's explore a feeling vignette style stories. No, I don't. No, I don't. And and I I have a, a fairly low bar for a story. Um, but but the the thing is with this that um, if if you consider the tower as as the main character, which I always have a little bit of trouble with. But anyway, um, so if if you if you take that as as read and you 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 assume that it's the then, then it does have some progression, but the problem is that that he says something like, you know, um, as I've noted through, throughout this document, I'm only repeating what I've heard. I myself have never seen the Red Tower. No one ever has, and perhaps no one ever will. So, so you, you, you just sort of think, well, how can you, how can you describe it then if no one's ever seen it? So there's, there's this. It's obviously something which, which people talk about. And, and and make up stories about, mm -hmm. which which is kind of strange because because then he's he's telling it as fact, um, so he's saying there is this and there are these levels and on this level this happens, but no one knows. So it's not it's not like that. It it's it's sort of kind of strange. Um, so so as far as as far, as far as it being a story is concerned, no, I I didn't enjoy that. Um, I, I did in, I enjoyed the reading, but I didn't enjoy having read it, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, Andy, you said it was a hot piece of garbage. Yep. Do you think it's because uh, it's plotless or is there another reason? No. Um, I, I can read something with a minimal plot. And even though this narrator didn't directly interact with the Red Tower, <clears throat> the basic plot is the same as any of the other creepy pasta let's explore spooky space story um it just it didn't nothing it was describing made me feel spooky mm -hmm. i just felt it was too obviously signposting everything and pointing and say look how spooky this is though isn't this a creepy thing and it's like well the more you tell me it's creepy the less creepy i actually feel mm-hmm so Gerald was saying, oh, continue. You were going to say something, Gerald? Yeah, I, I was just thinking that that I was I was thinking uh, my my sort of first thought 
just a minute ago was that you know it needed a character it needed a character to to do something but actually a character wouldn't have made much difference because a character would have gone round and seen exactly what he's describing so yeah so so it, it's it's yeah, this is this is now this is quite interesting now yeah so so ah oh, i wish i'd thought about this earlier so we're we're so we're not exploring a space a, a space we're exploring an idea of what people think about something um and about how i mean it's terribly detailed and, and yeah overwritten I, I think as well but but so what we're doing is is that we're we're exploring how strange people's ideas will get when they're when they're thinking about something that they don't understand maybe yes that's bringing me closer to what i thought this obviously represents so i guess i'll just say it well, now you're like okay. inching close to it i should probably tell you what i think it obviously represents yes go ahead what do you think it obviously represents so it just protrudes itself out of this barren wasteland. Mm -hmm. And at first it's the same color as everything around it, but then it turns red and it's got roots underground. Mm -hmm. That's a pimple. <laughs> it's about zits. It's an acne story. <laughs> I, I was waiting for some grand reveal. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I'm with you. Yes, I'm with you. Mm. Oh, <laughs> I think it's the human mind. Because in the beginning, um, it sort of blends in with the landscape and it's making these sort of horrible things that violate the purity of the rest of the landscape. The rest of the landscape is, uh, is considered pure. And then the, those pure thoughts sort of fight back and push the bad thoughts, the nightmares thoughts, increasingly underground until really they're just in your subconscious. And even the subterranean system of how it distributes and you find it later, no one knows its reaches where it will pop up. But all of a sudden, it could be in an attic. It could be in, a, in your own body and someone else. Like These horrible nightmarish thoughts that scare you can crop up sort of anywhere. And then the more you sort of like try to fight back and repress those thoughts, the deeper and deeper they go and the grosser and more depraved they get. I thought it was so obvious, but I guess not because I'm the only person thinking this way. So maybe I'm trying too hard. I don't know. But like, I, I didn't, I, that was my first read through. I was like, oh, it's the brain. And that's why oh, the only people who talk about it are people who are already meant unwell, described as uncertain of mind, delirious, right? It's not the super mentally healthy who are like, totally have demons in my subconscious guys. So now yeah, what does that say about you? I guess. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm like, I get it. <laughs> a clever reader. Yeah, I, I, actually, I can see that now. I can see that because everybody talks about it. Everybody talks about what it's like. So we all talk about what our thoughts are and, and, and what we understand of, of our environment and, and life in general. So we all, we're all have got this idea, and, but we've all got deep thoughts and dark thoughts that, that are repressed and pushed down. And the further you go and explore those dark thoughts, the more craven and the more the more weird and, and unpleasant they get. So I I can see that. And 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 you don't know where the thoughts are gonna come up. So so yes, these memories and thoughts all sit around in inside our head, and then all of a sudden one will pop up. So yeah, it, it may be. It may be. And and this narrator question. who is willingly who wants to explore those thoughts describes himself as a degenerate for wanting to do that. And also just things like why is the landscape gray? Like gray matter. Like there's just like there's like little things that just like to me seem to confirm like this really does seem a sort of metaphor for the mind and like where all of these thoughts are hidden. And if you go looking for them, is there something wrong with you? The people who understand it tend to be insane in some degree. And even the delivery system, the subconscious delivery system, it just sort of pops up in a way you didn't expect it or plan for. Mm. How is it not the brain? How is it not the mind? I because don't know. It's a pimple. Because it's a pimple. But I just, I really thought that when I Googled like the red tower, <laughs> Thomas Ligotti mind or brain, I would, so now it made me yeah, doubt I mean, myself, that... but. It's, 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 I think it's kind of strange to, to describe it as a tower um, 
because you know a tower is 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 quite sort of restricted in its in its size um and and, and tall um but yeah but it's sort of unrestricted in the subterranean level that is sprawling yes. in level one and you it can make sense to have a factory a place where these things are being made yes hmm mm -hmm. I don't know it's, it's either very clever or wrong <laughs> <laughs> but also as maya would have said um there is no real wrong when you're interpreting literature because it's either do you care about what the author intended or not and if you don't then whatever you got out of it is just as valid so. yeah good point good point but yeah i feel like i was taking crazy pills when no one else was saying this and i was like why <laughs> Really it's like don't you hear the voices they're everywhere it's yeah that's a good one well also, people think you're crazy when you say that too <laughs> i mean everyone else was talking about it and he's they just weren't using those words everybody's talking about it all the time mm -hmm. okay. and you know okay. it's also possible that maybe that's not what the author intended but that that it's there because the author thinks about that which he had written about in some other stories and a little bit of research into him he does a piece, he has a piece of nonfiction called, um, oh, what I? I just had it and I just lost it. It's called, it's like the case against humanity, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what it is? Did you find it too? So the case against humanity is basically how um, we should try to end humanity, like just stop it producing and die because um, self-awareness and consciousness is an aberration that only brings us pain. We're supposed to be bio robots. We actually, like, this is a glitch. And it's not the natural order of things because how can you live in a world where you know, where like basically optimism is an illusion that we buy into. Um, we already know that like love and happiness and everything's just like chemical things. We're bio robots who are tricking ourselves into the illusion to be happier. Otherwise, our lives would be horror all the time. He's a fun guy, this Ligotti. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and he was a strong influence on True Detective. A lot of those thoughts um, that he has in the case against humanity, um, is quoted in True Detective, slightly paraphrased, and um, Nick Pizzolatto, the guy who, or Pizzolatti, the guy who did True Detective, he, um, in some interviews, you know, said that that was an inspiration. Anyway, um, wow. yeah, he has something wow. called, I think it's Ahedonia. 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 Yep. Yeah. Ahedonia, which means he can't find pleasure in anything. Right. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a coincidence, though. <laughs> that someone with a hedonia has that philosophy of life. Yeah. And apparently when asked if he's a nihilist, he's like, look, I don't want to get overly complicated, but there's a lot of things I agree with. <laughs> so, yes. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. Interesting guy. Yeah. And when you're sort of going into the mind of somebody who has this sort of philosophy and then he writes this kind of story, it just seems to me real clear that it's a little bit like... Yeah, there's a lot, especially as you were saying, no one has seen this, right? No one's seen the mind, but no one has seen this yet. Everyone or a lot of people have some sort of relationship to it that he can talk to. There's this sort of sense also about the collective horrific imagination of the human mind as well. That enough people are like, oh, yeah, I totally know about this system you're describing. There's like a collective nightmarish imagination in the mind that everyone can sort of say that makes sense, right? Mm. Yeah, I buy into this. Although, what would you say if I told you he also suffered from severe acne? Then, I mean, <laughs> this pimple theory. <laughs> as far as I know, that's not true, but mm -hmm. hypothetically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what did you guys think about, like, my favorite thing <laughs> in this Red Tower, maybe you guys can tell me your favorite thing, but my favorite thing is subterranean level one, the distribution system. I really like that with or without the mind metaphor. Um, what did you guys make of the subterranean level? Like what did, did it make you think of anything? Yeah, yeah um, not, not necessarily think of anything, but, but I, I liked, I like, I like level one because there was more, there's more description, but also yes, quite good actually that, that there's more description on level one and the deep you go, there's, it becomes less solid. It becomes less well described, as as though it's it's like it's it's as you go deeper, it's darker, 
um, it's less clear about its function. So, so that was that was quite good. I quite like that. Mm. Yeah, I think level one definitely had the most meat on it. Even for it not to have a plot plot, there's there's action taking place in the description of level one. You know, things are moving around. They're going places. They're ending up in your attic. Mm-hmm. I I still like that graveyard bit though. Yeah, it was the graveyard your favorite part. <clears throat> Just that one line, like that's <laughs> that's such a good line. <laughs> you know, these aren't these aren't those type of graves, not burying graves, not that. <laughs> They're the other Earthing kind. graves. Earthing <laughs> graves, yeah. Of course. <laughs> like he just says they're not burying graves. And you're like, okay, what other types of graves are there? And then like two sentences later, just nonchalantly breaks out birthing graves. <laughs> what was your favorite part yeah. of the tower or the story, Gerald? Um, I don't, I don't think I had a, I don't think I had a favorite part. I, don't, I, I sort of, uh, I had I had an unfavorite part, and that was the uh, where just where it was sort of gray and gray and gray and gray and gray. <laughs> um, and and I I think I liked the start of it. I liked I liked the beginning where things seemed a lot more clear and a lot more well. Obviously, they they were better described because people knew you about it, and it, it and and it sort of drew me in because it was. I wanted to find out more about it. What is this place? What is this place that's got no doors on the ground level, and and, and all this sort of thing. So it, it was it was it was quite sort of interesting. Then further on, it just sort of seemed to get a bit bogged down in in too much description for me. So yeah, the the start, the the, the opening sort of, uh, I suppose the opening a thousand words or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so we already know how Gerald feels about the prose, and you found it overwrought, right, Andy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I always ask about the prose. I, it worked for me. There were some places where I was just like, uh-huh, I get it, but <laughs> I still liked it. He painted a really good picture of it. I could picture this red tower in my mind very clearly, um, the subterranean levels as well. Um and I, I really liked that subterranean level because even just the way he was describing it, even without the mind metaphor, was kind of funny because it's also just kind of like in the ways to ins like if you take it as a very literal like this is someplace on a planet that is distributing nightmares to people. Just a very interesting way of just like and here's a curse for you and here's a nightmare for you. Just <laughs> like they have carts that carry them. Like there's <clears throat> mm -hmm. there's specific vehicles in this subterranean level mm -hmm. to bring nightmares around with. Yeah, like like even if you take in a very literal interpretation that has nothing to do with the mind, it's still fun. Like just that distribution center of just like, and one day you're like moving house, you're unpacking, you find this, or like you're rebuilding something. Here it is under a floorboard, and now you're cursed for the rest of your life. It's like, <laughs> yes, it's fun. It's just a fun mechanism. Which maybe is Legati's this, not going for. <laughs> it's, it's quite it's quite interesting that that he 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 starts off and continues by describing the 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 products of this fact as novelty goods mm -hmm. which, which is sort of kind of strange it's it's, it's a very light thing with a, with obviously a very dark undercurrent to it and you know what's funny doesn't he make a point to say a fake disembodied hand so yes. i said this to my boyfriend and he and he was like a, a, they make disembodied hands then he like fixated on that and it was just like it'd be a lot easier to make real disembodied hands well but the nails <laughs> continue to grow the nails do continue to grow. But they do. Make... That's very good. Yeah. But at a factory, there's nothing usually to make than a real disembodied hand. So <laughs> right. It's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was, um, it was good. I liked it. I definitely want to read some of his other works that are more, um, that actually have plots. There's this one uh, anthology called Grim Scribe, which is about, I think, like a doctor who's obsessed with the paranormal and the freaky named Grimscribe, I think. I don't know. I kind of scanned the description. And the one that he's right. most um, famous for, Songs of a Dead Summer, I think. See, I had this all open and then I had to restart my computer. Start wow. Songs of a Dead Dreamer. That's what it is. Restarting my computer, I got all lost on my resources. <laughs> but <laughs> Songs of a Dead Dreamer um, sounds really good. That's the one that most people are like, read that one. 
I'm afraid to read his nonfiction, The Case Against Humanity, because what if it takes? I don't want it to take. <laughs> <laughs> you seem primed for it. Yeah. I seem primed. I'm like, I don't, I don't want this. I know, like, I don't tend to be depressive, but everyone has had a few depressive moments in their life, right? And in my few depressive moments, it's very much like, why even bother being in a relationship? It's all just chemicals in your brain. It's all a mass evolution. Why do anything if we're all going to die? Like, nope, I do not need Ligotti in my brain <laughs> giving me fuel for the next time I'm sad. <sighs> now he's, de he's delivered some of his novelties to you, hasn't he? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, anything else you guys want to add before we uh, rate this puppy? Wow. Oh, no, we don't, we've done over <clears throat> half an hour. Cracky. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll say this. Um, I think I would like to include in the liner notes Andy's pick for a creepy pasta that's much better done by a complete amateur. Mm. It's called The Stairs in the Doorway. By who? A guy who goes by the internet handle that I'm unable to pronounce, and I think it's Unxmall. U-N-X-M-A-A-L. Well, we'll put a link in the show notes so people can yeah. get properly creeped out. And can you explain what creepy pasta is for our listeners who don't know what a creepy yeah, pasta I don't is? Know. <laughs> for Gerald, I had actually prepared yeah. this for Gerald, but uh... oh, thank you. <laughs> so, creepy pasta is a derivation of copy pasta, and that should sum it all up. <laughs> copy pasta is basically like a written meme that you copy and paste on different forums. So it's like you know, short stories or whatever that you'd copy and paste. And then creepy pasta is horror stories of that. They're just shared and distributed internet wise. Mm -hmm. And there's like subreddits and different okay. forums that do a lot of creepy pasta stuff. And like Slender Man came out of creepy pasta, right? Yeah, Slender Man, yeah. Candle Cove, oh, also right. by Chris Straub. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, interesting. Um, anything else you want to add, or should we rate it? No, nothing more to add. Yep. Okay, I'll go first. I'm going to give it a. I should have. Maybe I should have figured out my number before I volunteered to go first. How about yes. a five? I think yes, because of without my metaphor, I would not have given it a five. But because my brain goes, this makes sense. This is how my mind works. Then I'm giving it a five. So yes, because of my metaphor, it's a five. <laughs> I'll allow it. Yeah. Because you're writing it at. I wanted in my heart to give it a one, but I think I'm just disappointed because I wanted to like this story so much and I didn't. So I'll give it a two. Wow. Well, go read Songs of the Dead Dreamer and then do a yeah. Thomas Ligotti <clears throat> review. Right. I'll, I'll come back to Ligotti on something else. Yeah. But I did not care for this. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I've four for me because it's not a story and it irritated me at one point so. <laughs> sorry, sorry Thomas if you're listening but I don't go. think he care he's exactly the right kind of person he if 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 based on what I've read about Thomas Ligotti if he were to listen to this which is already extremely unlikely but if he were I'm pretty sure he wouldn't be listening to this in the hopes of receiving praise which is meaningless so. <laughs> yes we're good. oh yes awesome we're good yeah, yeah. So we can pile on <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay good. so um the game is a lot of fun so and uh, i found a 2015 ranking of literary monsters by the av club so i'm gonna do is i'm gonna give you you're gonna have three chances i'm gonna give you a set of three literary monsters and you have to tell me which one was ranked highest according to this listing okay are we gonna tell you what stories we're su suggesting? oh yeah you should do that you should definitely tell me what <laughs> should we? you yeah? should yeah okay. that'd be good. That's, there's the thought there's a thought. <laughs> well, I, I'm putting forward something called Grandma's Porch by Alexia Tolas. Oh, okay. Keeping in the family oh. vein, I'm putting out Uncle Jim Called by David Rabe. Okay. Wait, I got to keep score because I can't memorize anything. All right. Good. So, <laughs> Andy's first. I'm going to give you three literary monsters. You got to tell me which one AV Club said is scariest. So is it? Is it is scariest the criteria? Not best or favorite, but scariest? They're going by scariest, but it's their ranking, not mine. So if you don't okay. agree, don't yell at me. That's okay. fair. Okay. I'm gonna yell at you anyway. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. So is it the giant squid from Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne's? 
the baby stealing goblins in Outside Over There by Maurice Sendak, or The Headless Horseman in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving? Probably The Headless Horseman. Yes, The Headless Horseman. Yeah. Okay. Gerald, mm. yep. is it um, Beldam, the mother who devours children's souls in Coraline by Neil Gaiman? Is it the subterranean cannibals known as Morlocks in The Time Machine by H.G. Wells? Or walking murderous plants called triffids in The Day of Triffids by John Wyndham. The Day of the Triffids, crikey. Um, <laughs> it's the first one, the Neil Gaiman one. It is. You guys are good at this. Yay. Yay. Okay, Andy. Is it Mr. Hyde in The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson? Is it Frankenstein's Monster in Frankenstein by Mary Shelley? Or is it The Unseen Evil, The Nothing in The Neverending Story by Michael Enda? Oh, man. I'm going to go with the nothing. It is the nothing. Yeah, yes. I was going to say that too. Spoilers for Stranger Things yeah. season three. Mm. But has everyone seen episode eight? Because it's the best. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I hated that section because I'm like, why are you doing a musical? And no, no, that's the best part. People are dying. Yes, because anyway. they started and it's such a tense moment. And I'm like, wow, are they really doing this? But then they just went all in. They went all in and they committed and it was worth it. Well, we spoil Stranger Things, so we're going to get hate mail. <laughs> Gerald. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> Go. Is it the White Walkers from Game of Thrones, George R.R. R. Martin? Is it the hideous six headed monster Scylla in the Odyssey? Or is it the Jabberwocky in The Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll? Scylla. It is Scylla. You guys are really good. I mean, Jabberwocky is knowing... famous for getting his head cut off. Like, he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't actually he's do much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, this is pretty useless. Last two questions. I do have a tiebreaker. Okay. <sighs> Andy, okay. is it? The Dementors and the Prisoner of Azkaban by J.K. Rowling? Is it the Nazgul and the Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien? Or is it the party pooping demon Grendel and Beowulf? I mean, Beowulf gets his arm cut off and cries to mom. It can't be him. I think the Nazgul are scarier wow. than Dementors. Yes, the Nazgul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gerald, wow. last one. You can either tie okay. with Andy or lose it all. Okay. <laughs> or lose. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Is it Pennywise in It by Stephen King? Is it Cthulhu and the Call of Cthulhu by Lovecraft, or is it Count Dracula and Dracula by Bram Stoker? That's a tough one. Yeah. No, it is a tough one. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 not. Um, it's it's one of the first two. Um, for me, it would be scarier. Yes, it is. That's the number one. Pennywise wow. got number one scariest wow. of all monsters. It is pretty scary. Well, yeah. He's the most active, I guess. Really. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these the guys sort of real sort of dread. Yeah. And, and and I love this sort of you know the the clown thing the 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 happy cheerful clown who's who's also a child killing monster. That's mm. uh, that's what pretty good. On fear, guys. There's, a, there's mm. a, a moral to this story. Just don't be afraid. All right. Tiebreaker. In what year was Cthulhu created? I'll give you a hint. Well, it's in the 1900s. <laughs> well, technically, Cthulhu existed before time because he's a remnant. Of <laughs> okay, when did Lovecraft publish a story with Cthulhu in it? <laughs> oh, I'll... I'll I'll go first. I'll say 1932. Wow. I was going to say 1933. Are you no. going to answer? I'm going to, out of respect for Gerald, I'll pick another number. Okay. No. No, no, no. I feel, I feel in my heart I should give you a buffer, and I'll say 1936. <laughs> well, you went in the wrong direction. It was 1928. Gerald wins. Oh, wow. Yep. We were close, though. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah, you guys got real close. Um, we should start a horror podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is the mind, but, guys. <laughs> yeah. okay. So next week, it's not. I don't think it's a horror. Um, <laughs> it's Grandma's Porch by Alexia Tolas. Okay, but before you go, tell us which depraved fantasies you entertain in your mind. Reach out via our Facebook group, The Literary Roadhouse Readers, or on Twitter, at Literary Roadhouse, or our website, literaryroadhouse.com. Do you need a break from the ghastly, grotesque, and insane? 
want to lose yourself in a different genre before daring to venture back into the degenerate mind of Ligotti? Then join us on Literary Roadhouse Book Club, where we read a novel each month. And lastly, this story reminded us that unseen terrors, in fact, do go bump in the night. Support our tinfoil hats and podcast expenses at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with the delirious, uncertain minds of the dying. Until next time, read a good story.